Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Berlin. I'm Xiao Wei. I'm senior director at Alibaba. Uh, in this talk, I will walk you through some of the challenges we went through in bringing Flink to large-scale production at Alibaba. Let me give you some background about the Alibaba Group. Alibaba Group is, uh, has the world's largest e-commerce ecosystem. Its, uh, its, its core e-commerce platform includes things like Taobao, Tmall, Alibaba.com, and AliExpress.com. It's also, it's, it, it consists of 25 companies. These companies span over travel, digital entertainment, logistics, and many other services. Alibaba also um, provides cloud service to customers inside and outside China. Another thing we do is we have a financial affiliate, Alipay or Ant Financials. In last fiscal year, Alibaba generated a gross merchandise volume of $550 billion. So um, this is, uh, if, if, if GME were GDP, this would put Alibaba as the 22nd largest economy in the world, right after Argentina. So um, Alibaba's e-commerce platform has uh, 466 million users which is roughly one third of China's population. And uh, we, we, um, we also have over 10 million business working in our platform. As you can imagine, from this massive scale of business, we will generate tons of data. Let me show you some statistics. The total amount of data we have is uh, many exabytes, and uh, it grows by terabytes every day. Our services generate about uh, over 100 billion events every day, and we process over 100 million events every second at the peak. So this massive scale presents a very interesting challenging challenge for our data infrastructure. To help you better understand these challenges, I will show you some examples and uh, use cases. These examples and uh, these use cases can be classified into a few patterns. In the first pattern, we have some fixed data and uh, we need to run different queries on top of it. This is the data warehouse scenario. In such a use case, what we do is the fixed data are usually organized as uh, static tables and uh, our data scientists will try out different queries to extract interesting insights and information from our data. Since this is the traditional batch job, since batch job is not the focus of this talk, I will not go into further details. In the second pattern, what we have is uh, the query is uh, fixed and known ahead of time, but the underlying data is changing over time. Let me show you a more concrete example. As you may know, November 11th is China's single day. On this day, a lot of things go on sale for 50% off. As you can see the, in the background, in, in 2016, Alibaba generated a gross merchandise volume of 120 billion Chinese yuan on single day, which trans translates into roughly $17.8 billion. To give you some comparison, uh, the, the, the single stay is very similar to Black Friday in the United States. In 2016, the United States generated uh, sales of $3.4 billion on Black Friday. And on Cyber Monday, it generated another $3.45 billion. So Black Friday and Cyber Monday adds up to something a bit less than $7 billion, which is still much less than the $17.8 billion that Alibaba generates in a single day. On, on this day, we, pre we, uh, we present some interesting real-time metrics to the media. Um, one of the most watched metric is the real-time GMV, how much transactions um, you have completed and how much, what's the total value of such transactions. So since we are talking about the financial data here, as you can imagine, we want to make sure every transaction uh, every transaction is counted and counted exactly once. At the same time, on this day, 
we are, uh, we, uh, there, is, uh, there are some interesting milestones on this day that's highly watched. Um, one of the interesting ones is uh, how long does it took, how long does it take for Alibaba to generate the GMV of 10 billion Chinese yuan? How much does it take, how long does it take for Alibaba to generate the GMV of 100 billion yuan? To accurately reflect, reflect, such, uh, uh, reflect such milestones, we had better to be able to display the real-time GME in a very tiny, ma tiny manner. So we have very low latency requirement for such pipelines. The real-time GME is uh, just one example of such jobs. In reality, there are hundreds of such jobs and hundreds of such metrics. The, Interesting thing about uh, the, 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 the interesting thing about all these jobs is uh, the, um, if you try to calculate real-time uh, data for using a batch job, for example, you can you can try to use a brute force way, try to run your query every once in a while, every few seconds. But uh, since the amount of data, amount of transactions is uh, enormous, you will quickly notice that your calculation becomes very expensive, if not impractical. So what we did is uh, we, instead of doing many repeated batch jobs, we will use streaming to incrementally calculate the result of our fixed query. In this case, the fixed query is the real-time GMB. Whenever a transaction arrives, we will update the result of this fixed query and the result will be stored in some storage system, such as the HBase. And uh, our front-end dashboard can query the storage system uh, to get its value. So as, uh, as, uh, as you can see, we, we need to process, uh, we, we have lots of such jobs, and these jobs will need to process uh, lots of events. And uh, on this day, the media is watching such dashboard all the time, so we, ha we had better make sure our service is uh, up and running all the time. Um, this example is a very, this, is, this use case is a very typical example of doing streaming. In such, use, in such case, you have some fixed query known ahead of time, and uh, you will want to calculate the result of such query whenever data changes using streaming. Let me show you a similar but more complex use case. So, this is the online machine learning job. Um, a machine learning usually have two ingredients. The first ingredient is uh, are the features, and the second ingredient are the uh, models. And in, uh, the features basically characterize the samples. It can be things like how many, how many clicks your product had in the last minute, in a minute, or how many impressions your product had in a minute. It can also be things like, what's the inventory of your product? These are interesting signals uh, when you do ranking or matching uh, in, your, in your online services. Traditionally, such things, such features and uh, models are computed once every day, once every week, or even once every month, which, is, uh, which in some cases might be a good enough approximation, but it's uh, not always, uh, it misses some opportunities. Imagine that your product, your product is, uh, uh, the inventory of a product is very low. You might want to lower the ranking of your product because uh, it would be bad experience if you also click on your product and couldn't buy it. So uh, if we can provide the real-time value of our features, we should be able to uh, get, get better experience for our users. The, so, we, so we did online feature update jobs. In our online feature update jobs, we, uh, we will calculate the features that are interesting to our system uh, using streaming. Whenever some, interested, uh, when, whenever some interesting events arrive, we will update such features at real time with uh, very minimal delay. The second part of uh, online machine learning is uh, the real time online training, model training. You might be a bit surprised and assume that the, because the model usually reflects the behavior of a user. You might be surprised that and assume that the user's behavior does not change that much. So there is no need for online model training. 
which uh, which can be true sometimes, but uh, there are some there are some cases this is not a good approximation. The best counter example is probably the uh, the case about uh, about single stay, because on single stay everything is going on sale for 50 percent off. So you can imagine people were in a buying spree, they will have a hard time resisting themselves from buying. So, which basically means their behavior will be very different from any other day. So whatever model you changed previously will not accurately reflect the behavior of user on that day. To make the best, to make the best out of it, we decided to do online model training as well. In 2016, what we did is we used the streaming to implement the uh, real-time reinforcement learning. Which, gave us, which gives us a 30% boost in conversion rate in our search results, which is awesome. Uh, here are some interesting properties of our online machine learning jobs. First, the events needed by, on, by our online machine learning jobs are usually stored in a lots of different systems inside the company. And, uh, our online machine learning jobs usually have very large states because it needs to calculate uh, uh, the features, the real-time features. And uh, uh, the online machine learning jobs usually also have very complex logic, uh, especially around the windowing and the joining. Finally, the online machine learning jobs, not all data needed by the online machine learning jobs are always available in the form of events. Some of the data needed are actually present in some storage systems such as the HBase. So it's crucial for us to be able to, uh, for us to be able to uh, query such external storage system efficiently in our jobs. So in these two examples, we use the streaming to calculate the result of a fixed query running on top of changing data. What about if both the data and the query are changing. This is uh, our third pattern. Let me give you an example. Our machine learning engineers from time to time will want to try out different models. What they do is they put, the, they put both models in production and divert some of the traffic to model A and some of the traffic to model B, and watch how user reacts to his uh, models. The user's reactions are usually recorded as events. The um, machine learning engineers will usually go, when, wait for the next day and uh, run some batch queries over such, uh, uh, s such events to get insights about the performance of his uh, models. The problem with this approach is uh, it will take a long time to iterate to try out different models and try out different algorithms. So we want to improve this and uh, implement the real-time A-B test, testing infrastructure. The interesting thing about this use case is that the machine learning engineers may want to break down the metrics across different dimensions. For example, across different demographics or income groups, or even some combination of such dimensions. If you try to use a streaming job to calculate, uh, uh, if you try to use a streaming job to calculate each one of such combinations, you will quickly realize that uh, such combinations are actually exponential, and uh, it can become very expensive. You will need to write lots of jobs to do that, and uh, this is not only tedious, but uh, uh, it may consume a lot of resources. So in this case, what we did is uh, we are combining streaming together with some um, current store or OLAP system to achieve, the, to achieve this goal. The streaming, the streaming job will pre-aggregate all the uninteresting dimensions. Uh, uh, will pre-aggregate all the, un the matrix over all the uninteresting dimensions. The pre-calculated result is uh, populated into a calling style like a Druid. Once this, once this is in Druid, the machine learning engineers can use OLAP to query Druid and to get whatever breakdown 
he is interested in and evaluate the performance of his models. So, during, so using such in, 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 in practice, we, we notice that there are many such use cases that uh, by combining streaming and the OLAP system, it gives us both the freedom, the flexibility to handle changing data as well as, change, as, well as handling changing queries. So this is a quick summary of the different challenges we had. Um, as you can see, Flink is uh, very well suited to meet some of these challenges. Flink introduced the uh, one of the biggest innovations Flink had is the introduction of states in streaming. By the introduction of states, it makes it uh, relatively straightforward to write very complex logic such as windowing and joining in Flink. This becomes straightforward. Flink also introduced the Chandy Lampo checkpoint mechanism, which provides exactly one semantics in the case of uh, failure. Um, the interesting about this mechanism is it allows us to achieve very high throughput and at the same time maintain very low latency. So uh, we decided to use Flink for all our streaming use cases. But there are also some unique challenges presented by the scale of business at Alibaba. For example, we have lots of jobs which run on, which run on thousands of machines, and uh, these state, uh, such jobs have uh, lots of states, and uh, we have very strict SLA requirement. So we decided to start the Blink project. This project aims to improve Flink so it's working at the largest scale. Blink is basically Alibaba's version of Flink. One thing I want to mention is that we are constantly working with the community to integrate our changes back to the community. So most of the changes uh, I'm going to talk about today, you will be able to get it very quickly, very soon. Let me, so we made tons of change in improvements in Flink to make it uh, uh, work well at a larger scale. But let me give you just some, some of the highlights uh, of the work we did. In the online machine learning example, we explained that uh, some of the data we needed in streaming are actually uh, not stored in events, but stored in some external database, such as the HBase. And we need a way to efficiently query such data. So um, previously, what we do in a Flink task is uh, whenever we get a record, we will make a request to the external service and wait for the external service to reply. Once we get a response, we do some further processing before we go on to process the next record. The problem with this approach is, uh, as you can see, the task will spend some time doing the waits. This will reduce the throughput of our Flink task. Another problem caused by this is uh, the throughput of your task, your, of your Flink task, is uh, actually limited by the latency of the external service, not by the throughput of the external service, which basically means you cannot use up all the power of your external service. Even if your external service can handle much more throughput, you might, be, you might not be able to use it. Um, another issue caused by this approach is once you start waiting, you, it's hard to predict how much time you will be spent waiting versus uh, doing useful work. So when you uh, you, need, you will have a hard time deciding how much CPU resource you should request from the underlying cluster managers. You will either over-request or under-request CPU resource. So we decided to fix this. The idea, the key observation is that in a lot of cases, querying, querying external service, uh, uh, there are actually no dependency in querying external services. So while we, are, while we send the first record to query, query the external service for the first record, we can, while we are doing the wait, we can keep sending the second record, the third record. By doing this, it will reduce the wait, or in ideal case, eliminate the waits, which will give us a much better performance, in, which will give us much better throughput uh, in a Flink task. 
And uh, another interesting thing is, uh, since there is, uh, you, you eliminate the weight, you no longer need to worry about uh, how much resource you should request from your underlying cluster manager. We put this online in production and notice that in a lot of jobs, this gave us a huge boost in throughput, sometimes up to 2x or 3x improvements. And this feature is already available in uh, Flink 1.2. OK, now let me talk about the incremental checkpoint. As uh, I mentioned earlier, one of the largest innovations of Flink is uh, the introduction of states into streaming. It's hard to overemphasize how evolutionary uh, this, 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 uh, this invention is. It uh, fundamentally changes the uh, architecture of uh, streaming as well as the architecture of storage systems. Uh, let me just... Uh, Mention one of these uh, interesting problems uh, in, the, in, in the architecture before Flink. Before Flink, before we have uh, states in streaming, what we usually do is uh, we store the states in some centralized database, as Stefan was mentioning yesterday. And uh, every Flink, uh, to get the best scalability, you most likely will shard all your data across all different database servers. So each of, uh, each of your tasks will need to talk with uh, all the database servers very likely. And uh, if there is uh, some performance issue with one of the database servers, it means that the uh, majority of the tasks will, will, will be affected. The performance of the majority of the tasks will be affected in your cluster. So what we observe in reality is uh, whenever there is a bad region server which gives a slow response, the QPS of the whole cluster will drop dramatically, sometimes approaching zero. This is uh, actually a very tough problem to solve, but uh, uh, this, is, this is what I refer to as the single point of failure in performance. It's uh, um, when your cluster gets larger and larger, you will have more machines, and the probability of one of the machines, one of the database servers becomes slow uh, increases. So the performance of your application does not scale. In such case, Flink solved this problem by getting rid of the centralized database. It uh, basically moves some of the data that will traditionally be stored in centralized database, such as HBase, into a state in Flink operators. Yeah, since we migrated some of our jobs from uh, our previous streaming system to Flink, we have uh, estimate we estimate that maybe around 80% of the QPS requests on our edge base went to, uh, are eliminated and uh, went to the states. So this is a fundamental change in the architecture of streaming applications. Um, basically, using this state, Flink uh, is taking, taking over a lot of responsibilities that are usually managed by the centralized database systems. But this also means a lot of the issues and problems that we need to solve in a centralized database system, now we will need to solve in Flink. There are many such issues, and uh, I can keep talking about it for probably the rest of this day. But uh, in this talk, I will just mention one, uh, the simplest one. How do we handle large, large amount of states? Uh, Flink has the Chandy Lampa checkpoint mechanism to uh, uh, several states so it can be recovered in case of failover. What we, uh, there are several state backend that's provided by Flink. Um, the, in, the, in the case of this, in, in our case, our state is pretty large, so we use the RocksDB based state backend. In RocksDB, the data or states are stored as a set of SST files. Every time when a checkpoint comes in, what we do is we take a snapshot of the uh, RocksDB and uh, copy in the SST files over to a persisted storage, such as HDFS. The problem with this approach is uh, when the state of your application gets larger and larger, the checkpoint will take longer and longer. And in addition, if you have very large state, the checkpoint will take a very long time to complete, which basically means in the case of a failover, you will need to recover, replay more messages to get to, 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 to recover from the failure, which 
hurts the SLA because it will take, uh, you will have more downtime in the case of failover. So we try to improve on this. The idea is actually straightforward. Instead of copying all the files in every checkpoint, we just need to identify all the new files in a checkpoint uh, and copy this over. In this example, in checkpoint two, we see 2.SST and 3.SST are already available, are already present in checkpoint one, and we can reuse these files in checkpoint one. We just need to copy the new file for that SST. This greatly reduced the cost of checkpoint. Checkpoint will be much faster to complete, which also gives us a much faster recovery time. This feature was uh, already available in Flink 1.3. So it's one of the biggest blockers to uh, uh, get a very large job running. Now let's, talk, let's take a look at the Flip 6 improvement, which is a new deployment and the process, process model. Before Flip 6, for every Flink cluster, there is a job manager who is responsible to manage all the jobs and the tasks in that Flink cluster. So when your cluster has lots of jobs and lots of tasks, the job manager can potentially become a bottleneck. To solve this problem, we introduced the concept of job master in Flip 6. A job master manages a single job, so uh, it allows us to have lots of jobs in a single Flink cluster. In addition, before Flip 6, um, tasks from different jobs can potentially be running in the same task manager. But if there are some issues with the, a task, it can potentially crash the task manager, which may affect tasks from a different job. This is poor isolation between the jobs. With Flip 6, we make it uh, possible to never assign two tasks from different jobs into the same task manager. This gives us a much better isolation between jobs. Another thing we introduced in Flip 6 is the resource manager abstraction. Whenever a job master decides that his job needs more resource, it will ask for the resource from the, res from the resource manager, which will in turn request the resource from the underlying cluster manager. And when a job master decides that some resource is no longer needed by his job, he can release his, uh, res uh, the resource to the resource manager. This, give, this will give us a much better utilization of resource in our clusters. The resource usage will be dynamic or elastic. Finally, the resource manager abstraction makes it uh, relatively straightforward to add support for new cluster managers. Currently, we have the support for young methods and uh, standalone mode. So, this is probably one of the largest changes we have made. Um, we have been working together with the open source community, especially the data artisan folks, uh, since a year ago. And uh, I'm very excited to tell you that uh, it looks that this can be the default mode from Flink 1.4 uh, on. Um, this change solves lots of the scalability problems we have in our production. For, for anyone who uh, have run some streaming jobs in production, yeah, it's uh, obvious that the monitoring your jobs is uh, also a crucial part of the game. Once the jobs are on production, you need to be able to tell if your job is performing as expected. And in the case that there are some issues with your jobs, there are got to be good metrics to identify the issues, to figure out which operator is uh, causing the uh, back pressure, for example, or which operator is uh, having some fatal errors. To this end, we introduced hundreds of metrics in our system, which allows us to troubleshoot any issues we might have and monitor the health of our systems. 
This matrix includes the latency, data latency, uh, the, the, the data delay during ingestion, the process latency, the incoming and outgoing QPS, and the CPU and memory utilization in our streaming jobs. With these changes, we were able to uh, scale think into very large clusters and uh, uh, run lots of jobs in our clusters, lots of big jobs in our clusters. We also made a bunch of reliability improvements to meet the SL requirements that we have. So this is the main focus of what we had in 2016. In 2017, we started to look, look into productivity. In 2016, most of the streaming jobs we had in production are written in data stream API. The interesting thing about the data stream API is uh, a lot of people, when, when they started using it, they get really excited. They are impressed by the power and the flexibility of data stream API. But after a while, we observed two phenomena. First, there are some entry-level users who don't really understand all the uh, uh, interesting, important things about how to write best data stream program. And uh, they, make, they, make, they make mistakes, and their program will suffer in performance or reliability. There are second category users who are really advanced, who understand all the details of data stream API, what's the best way to write data stream API, and data stream programs. They do lots of sophisticated optimization by their hand in their, in their data stream programs. But both of, these, uh, both of these can be problem for productivity. It's uh, uh, because any optimizations that uh, the sophisticated users did will only be available to his job instead of available to lots of other similar jobs. So uh, we decided to have a push for the productivity. What's the best way, what's the simplest way to write a streaming program? How do we lower the bar of writing a streaming program? We decided to use SQL. SQL is a 40-year-old language. It has some interesting characteristics. SQL is declarative, which basically means with SQL, you express the semantics of your computation but you don't tell the system how to do the computation. This job is left to the optimizer in your system, which understands all the details of your uh, runtime engine and generates the best plan to execute your code. So um, in the case of uh, entry-level user, he will not need to worry about that his code will be uh, poorly performing. And in the case of advanced user who can and do very advanced optimizations. Such optimizations you know, can, be, can potentially be uh, leveraged in the query optimizer and make it available to a lot of other similar streaming applications. So SQL is uh, optimizable. It, uh, uh, the, the user no longer need to worry about all the implementation details of SQL. SQL is also uh, used by a lot of people and uh, by a lot of tools. So if your project has several people working on it and you express your computation using SQL, the um, people can actually read it and understand what this code does, this, which makes the collaboration inside your project much more efficient. It's understandable. SQL is a relatively stable language which basically means in the case that your runtime upgrades, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very likely that your SQL program will uh, keep working and you don't need to worry about breaking API changes. And uh, finally, but very importantly, SQL unifies batch and streaming. One of the starting points of Flink is uh, it tries to unify batch and streaming. It considers batch as a special case of streaming. A batch is basically a finite stream, and it uses the same runtime in both the case of batch and streaming. But unfortunately, at the operator API level, it has the data set API for batch and the data stream API for streaming. 
So in the case that your product needs to have both a batch pipeline and a streaming pipeline, you will need to develop uh, two pipelines. This is not only time consuming, but uh, it can become non-trivial to keep the two in sync. So the way we deal with this in SQL is uh, by expressing your computation logic using SQL, um, you, can run your, you can run your SQL program either in batch mode or in streaming mode, or even as a combination of the two. For example, you can use the streaming job to incrementally update the snapshot that you generated uh, during your, by your batch programs. But one, there is one problem. How, how do we make sense out of SQL in the case of streaming? SQL makes sense in a straightforward way in the case of a batch, just like uh, any data warehouse application. Uh, you can, for example, you could use Hive to do your batch queries. But uh, in the case of streaming, there is one crucial difference. The underlying data is changing over time, and we will need to, we will need to generalize the concept of static table in batch to dynamic tables. A dynamic table is basically a table whose content can change over time. So if you get a dynamic table and uh, take any time, you can get a snapshot of the dynamic table at that moment. If you have a, se a sequence of increasing time, you can take a sequence of snapshots uh, at such times, and you will get a sequence of snapshots. If you take the continuum limit, this becomes your dynamic table. Once we have a dynamic, ta dynamic table, we can define the concept of continuous queries. For each snapshot, you can run your fixed query over this snapshot, which will generate another output snapshot. If you run such fixed query of all snapshots in a sequence, you will get a sequence of output snapshot, which is basically becoming your output dynamic table. So dynamic table is closed under the operation of a continuous query. If you have some dynamic tables and you run some continuous queries over such dynamic tables, you will get another dynamic table. Once you get an output dynamic table, you can derive the change log from this dynamic table, which will be your output stream in your streaming program. From this definition, it becomes very obvious that the batch SQL is just a spatial case. Batch query is just a spatial case of continuous query. In the case of batch, your dynamic table is basically just a step function whose value, whose snapshot was empty uh, initially, but become the content of your static data uh, after, after, after some time. And uh, uh, this approach defines the semantics of uh, streaming SQL and unifies the semantics of streaming SQL and batch. Now we got the semantics of our streaming SQL. The next thing that we need to do is to implement all the SQL functionalities in continuous query. This is a quick summary of the improvements we did. On the coding side, we introduced the concept of user-defined table-valued function, as well as user-defined aggregates. We also implemented various different joining, joining uh, operators. The, another interesting thing we did is uh, retraction support for aggregates. Retraction is a very unique phenomenon in streaming. It's, uh, it, it exists because the need to uh, because the need to change the output result in the case of streaming. Um, writing SQL is uh, SQL uh, SQL query is is just one part of the game. It's just one part of the query language. There are uh, some other interesting things like the DML insert statement, as well as the various DDL statement. Most of our work has been integrated back in our in Flink's master. By introducing SQL, we were able to convert majority of our jobs from data stream jobs to SQL. 
And uh, this includes the most complex online machine learning jobs. It has greatly simplified the logic of a streaming program. People can read it, and the size of the program are usually reduced by more than half. So it, it greatly improved the productivity. But SQL is great, but uh, writing your streaming job is just, part of the, is just a part of the game. After your job is written, you will need to get the job in production and uh, manage your jobs. That's, what we that's why we studied the string computer platform. The string computer platform is an integrated development environment for, uh, for, for streaming. Let me show you a quick snapshot of the string computer platform. On the right-hand side, you can see this is the panel that you write your SQL program. You, uh, you see some DDL statement. So a user will first write SQL program in this string computer platform. Then he can up upload some testing data in the string computer platform and run his streaming program as a test and check if the result is expected. Once the result are uh, fixed and uh, uh, works according to, uh, according to the design, um, the user can push a button to deploy his uh, streaming job into production. Once the job is running in our production clusters, the user can use the string computer monitoring functionality to monitor the health of his job. This includes the various metrics we added um, in Flink, as well as like, uh, uh, various debugging functionality. You can even set up alerts in your stream program to get notified if there is any glitch in your program. By doing this, by, doing this, by introducing the stream computer platform, it gave us an end-to-end experience for developing uh, developing, debugging, deploying, and monitoring, managing our streaming jobs. It greatly improved the productivity. This platform is uh, um, used by a lot of internal customers. Uh, recently, it's uh, also become uh, publicly available in our early cloud, uh, in, our, in, in early cloud as an uh, invited beta. Some invited customers are trying out the string computer platform over Blink. This is great. Uh, the, it becomes much easier it, uh, to develop and manage your streaming programs. But uh, some people we talk to still complain. Writing SQL is not so easy. It's complex. I, if you look at like a, a SQL statement that's a few pages long, it can be difficult to understand. How can we make it even better, even easier to do streaming? So we introduced a different way to write your, SQL, write your streaming program. This is our drag and drop approach. It's uh, mostly used in our online machine learning jobs. What we do is uh, we will have the abstraction of components. Each component is basically some predefined module which does some transformation on the inputs and generates some outputs. So in this, in this mode, what uh, our developers do is uh, they drag and drop some of the components into the canvas, configure such components, and uh, connect these components. The connected tag of, uh, forms a streaming program, and uh, we use a compiler to compile it into a Blink SQL job. Once it's in Blink SQL job, we can use the same same tools that we had in our string computer platform to debug, deploy, and monitor our jobs. The, uh, a lot of people find that the, by, doing, by, doing, by writing your streaming jobs using drag and drop, it becomes even easier to understand than a complex SQL query. It's a further improvement to the productivity uh, of developing streaming. Now, let me try to summarize 
the uh, the architecture, the real-time data inflow architecture at Alibaba. At the bottom, we have thousands of machines. Of such machines, we have uh, various cluster managers, such as uh, Hadoop, the Young, and the HDFS. Over the cluster manager, we have, we have the Flink or Blink. Um, at the runtime, we made lots of improvements to make the runtime scale to thousands of machines and lots, lots of jobs. And uh, we currently have thousands of SQL jobs running in our production. Such SQL jobs uh, are usually developed through the string computer platform, which gives users a very productive and friendly IDE to develop and managing their streaming programs. And finally, the stream computer platform is uh, used by lots of products internally. Uh, it also will become available in early cloud, so external customers can try it. OK, let me summarize a takeaway. At Alibaba, we use Flink or Blink to process massive amount of data in a lot of products. So the, the, uh, we are running very large clusters, and uh, uh, Flink scales pretty well in such cases. And with the, with the help of uh, Flink SQL, as well as string computer platform, we believe that Flink or Blink is ready for mass adoption. Thank you.